Well, I've already got a really nice introduction, but uh, I'm Paul Van Damme. I'm going to talk a bit about our JavaScript app development stack, or rather, um, uh, how we got there, because it was, uh, uh, yeah, it was quite an adventure actually getting there, because there's a, the moment you start doing JavaScript, you uh, start to notice there's just so much going on out there, there's just so many libraries, frameworks, and uh, everybody's telling you that uh, this or that is right. Um, and I learned a great deal uh, in the last uh, six to eight months or so. Um, and I'm, uh, this is a behind the scenes event, so I want to tell you a bit about that journey there. Um, let's start at the beginning, because I started working for Google not that long ago, actually in March this year, so that was about eight, eight months ago. And uh, from, from day one, everybody was telling me, like, take it easy, there's a, there's a lot going on. Uh, Google develops a lot of software themselves, and there's a lot of different environments, and there's really a lot to learn, it's, it's totally true. Uh, especially the first few weeks, you, are, you have no idea what you're doing. And I still sometimes have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm pretty sure at least some of my colleagues agree there. Um, what's really important to know at, uh, at Kublu, though, is that there's this trend going on, going from uh, like bigger solutions to uh, smaller, a bit more uh, manageable solutions. And uh, for example, we are heavily invested in, um, in, uh, in, in creating microservices. So instead of having very big databases bases to talk to me, talk to the small microservices. And the team that I joined uh, was actually working on an API client for uh, for those microservices. And there's not a lot of front-end work in building an API client. It's mostly PHP in our case. So I decided to, uh, to find something else to do. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a big application we have running. It's, it's been uh, running for a while. A lot of people internally use it, and uh, it gets the job done. I mean, we use it for managing our website, and it gets the job done. Uh, and this is a homegrown website. We created this ourselves uh, probably a long time ago, and we're still using it, still building it. Um, but in the um, yeah, but looking at how we try to uh, uh, make things smaller, I wanted to see if we the next functionality that we were supposed to add to this, if we could create uh, a new smaller tool to do that instead of adding more to this uh, to this thing. Um, and this is mostly, uh, you know, the old click and refresh kind of application, or uh, a multi-page application. Um, and I probably don't have to tell you what the disadvantages are of having such an application. You see, it's really hard to have any true uh, interactions. Every interaction maps to a URL, and you can push information, blah, 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 yada, yada. Um, and probably one of the most important things about such an application is if you put somebody behind a computer 10 years ago, you put them behind a web application, that's probably what they expected. But if you put them behind a computer today and tell this is the web application you're going to use, they probably expect more something like a, a desktop kind of application, where there's just a lot more interaction going on instead of click and refresh, click and refresh. So we kind of reached the limit of the, of the possibilities with this application. So the first thing you do is like, well, we have this multi-page application, let's turn it into a single-page application. And I have to admit I really hate the term single page application because it kind of continues on the whole paradigm of pages and when you have an online application you don't actually have pages anymore, you have just an application with state, so why would you even call it a single page application? It's kind of weird, so I prefer just using it a web app or a JavaScript application. Uh, there are several ways of getting there, I mean, we could just throw in some vanilla JavaScript or some jQuery and uh, get the whole thing going. And that's how we, uh, uh, it's probably not, I mean, this is perfect for building a website. I mean, you have your normal pages, and this is really nice to have uh, uh, add, add that as a kind of layer of progressive enhancement. But you don't really want to build an entire application built on this. You're going to regret this pretty quickly. You want to add some sort of pattern to it, and um, uh, also some way to enforce the use of that pattern. And, the most usual way of doing that is by adding some JavaScript framework. And a framework is basically just that. It's, uh, by, it's, it's a way to enforce a pattern on your developers and make sure that they use that pattern. And there's actually a lot of discussion going on right now about whether you even should use frameworks online, which is kind of a silly discussion if you ask me, because uh, when you need a framework or a library, you use a, link, uh, a library or a framework, and if you don't, you don't. And I expect the developer to know when or when not to use it. So there's no right or wrong. I mean, it's not like uh, using frameworks is wrong. I think it's right, kind of see. 
Um, one of the most obvious choices, if you want to go for a big JavaScript framework, would be Angular. I mean, almost everybody is using Angular. Uh, there's a very large community, a very active community, and uh, it's also relatively easy to find developers for Angular, which is very important for us. Um, I go through a lot of resumes, and almost every resume says Angular, so I'm expecting that everybody is an Angular expert these days. Um, but there are also a few issues with Angular, and one of the issues I have with Angular is that it is another big framework set. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a bit more of a, a flexible, versatile toolkit for Google and not this big framework where we basically sort of get like a vendor lock-in. The moment we start using Angular, we will be using Angular for a long time. And that's not really what I wanted. Um, the second thing, and perhaps that's even more important, was um, about six months ago they were talking about Angular 2, and it was not going to be backwards compatible. Uh, it had a lot of new cool features, but we couldn't actually start using it yet. Um, but that was it. It was not going to be backwards compatible. And I don't really want to introduce new technology at Blue that was basically outdated from day one. So Angular kind of, kind of didn't cut it for me. But there are other options. Um, and Angular 2 has these nice new features, uh, like a component-based UI and uh, uh, it, it removes two-way data binding from, uh, uh, from its system uh, in, in favor of more unidirectional data flow, which is a pretty big mouthful. But the thing is that uh, you can already start using all those cool features today. Actually, you could already start using those features like a year ago, because Angular 2 didn't get those uh, from themselves. And of course, I'm talking about React. React is a, a UI library uh, created by Facebook. And I'm saying library because it's not a big framework. It's just a tool for building uh, UI components. And uh, that's also the thing that I really like. I mean, I can use React with anything I want. I mean, if I want to have a router, I can just npm install the router that I want. There are a lot of them out there. Um, it even goes as far as that the whole DOM integration is optional. Yeah. And that's actually kind of interesting because um, you don't have to use um, uh, React for uh, for the web. You can use React for native as well. You can. We had a hackathon a while ago, a couple, two months ago or so, and we. I've ne never created a, a native app in my life. And we have two days, and we managed to create a fully working uh, a mobile app with React Native. So it's it's really useful to have uh, a tool that's so versatile, especially in a company like Google. Uh, the way it achieves this, this React is basically sort of like a universal uh, abstraction for anything you can create a renderer for. It. So it can render to DOM, it can also render to just JavaScript, or uh, to uh, uh, HTML, which is actually a different thing, or it can render to native calls, or it can render to a JavaScript API, or anything you, you want. And yeah, it makes it really flexible for you for style. And I thought it really, really good match for uh, for Clue. The way it achieves it is a bit Weird, perhaps, especially if you look at it for the first time. The first time I looked at the at the React homepage and I saw a, roughly an uh, 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 example like this, I was kind of appalled by the whole idea of having HTML inside my JavaScript. But the thing is, this is not HTML. Um, I'm talking, of course, about this little bit here. Um, this is not HTML. It's really important to realize. Of course, if this was really HTML, then this whole JavaScript would not run. But this is actually transformed into uh, 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 to JavaScript calls to create elements. And that's the whole power of React, because those elements could be anything. On, a, on an iOS device or an Android device, those could be native uh, containers. Or on the web, those could be uh, document elements. Or on the, if you use this on the server side, it could be HTML. So that's actually the real power of, uh, of uh, React. That's, uh, so once you, the first time you see this kind of, and the second time you start to get your wrap your head around it, and you start to find the power in there. Now this is a great time to catch my breath. Nothing is actually going to happen, but let's look at it anyway. The thing is, a JavaScript app usually is just a blank page. Um, you just send a blank page with a bunch of JavaScript in there, and from there the entire application will bootstrap itself from there, create. Uh, the entire uh, graphical user interface uh, in, in DOM. But that's, uh, that has a 
couple of big advantages. And you see it online sometimes now uh, on websites as well that if you turn off JavaScript, you have nothing, you just get a white page, which is not a really good experience. Uh, so it's not really ideal for search engine optimization or accessibility, or, uh, but also about performance. Because DOM calls are very expensive. So building an entire GUI from scratch on the client can take a long time, several seconds actually. And if you have an Android device, it might even take minutes. Um, but this is actually another really cool part of, uh, of, uh, of React. Because everything is JavaScript. You can literally just run the same code base on the, that you have on the client. You can just run it on the server as well. Uh, you can reuse the entire uh, code base. And because on the client you might render everything to, to DOM, but you can render the same stuff on the server to HTML, and you can just pre-render a whole page and send that to the client, and have everything uh, bootstrap from there, which will save you a lot of time. And also, it's obviously very nice for search engine, search engine optimization or uh, accessibility and, and stuff as well, because you have a normal HTML page to start with. And you can reuse everything. You can also reuse your routing, for example, all the URLs you specify on the client that if you click this, then this, this happens, and that part of the application runs, etc. You can just reuse that on the server, and all your URLs will also automatically render into normal HTML pages. Basically, if you turn off JavaScript in your JavaScript app, it will still work, which is kind of fun. So, let's assume you've created this awesome UE because React. Yeah. And, um, Actually, that's just the easy part, unfortunately. Um, creating the UE is the, the easiest part of building a web app. The difficult part is actually managing the whole flow of data that's going through your application. I mean, users will be clicking stuff, they will be uh, uh, touching stuff, and uh, Ajax calls will be fired, data will need to be updated, and a lot of stuff will happen. And that's actually the hard part to realize in, a, in an application. And again, there are a lot of ways of doing that. The most obvious way would be some sort of model view controller pattern. Um, this is used a lot. Um, we also use this a lot on, on our website. And this is actually a model view kind of pattern. It's really great for uh, really a bit more static user interfaces. So when you're on the side, client side, for example, building a, uh, a web page that you just send to the server, it's really good for that. But the moment you start to add a lot of interaction and use it on the client side with a more graphical user interface, it usually starts to end up more like this. This is also what Facebook found out. Um, they were using some type of model view as well in their, in their, uh, their applications, or in their website even. And uh, yeah, you get a lot of cascading updates between models and views and a lot of dependencies that you don't really want. And so they, uh, they decided to figure out something new and they uh, called it Flux. Uh, anybody here has heard of Flux before? Okay. Um, the whole idea be behind Flux is that you have this unidirectional data flow. And I said it earlier already, that's one of those cool new features of Angular 2. Uh, the idea behind it is that you have, uh, you have your view, which could be like a list of items, let's put it simply. Um, that, and at the end of the line of uh, one of those items, I clicked a little uh, trash can because I want to remove one of those items. Um, an action will be fired that's for removing that item. This will go through a central dispatcher, there's only one of those, it's pretty easy. Uh, and that will update the stores that are interested, the stores of data that, will, that are interested in uh, that kind of action. Now obviously we're gonna have some kind of store that holds all the, the data for uh, the list of items and it's interested in an item is removed, so it will listen to that, and the item is removed from that list. And the same goes on through to the views uh, that are listening to interesting changes in the stores and the list of the view for the, uh, the item list is interested and it will remove that item from the actual visible view as well. So you get a really nice flow of data through your application. And another really nice thing by the way is because you only have one dispatcher and everything that happens in your application goes through the one single <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, dispatcher, you can just log that and you can literally have a log of everything that goes on inside your application which makes it really easy to, uh, to, uh, to debug as well. Again, important to note here is that this is not a, a framework, it's not even a library. Uh, this is just an idea that Facebook had. Uh, they, does, they do give you some code for a dispatcher that they use in the website, in their website, but uh, 
yeah, the moment you do that, and tell developers you get like, I think within like a month there were dozens of different implementations for Flux. Now we have to try to pick one. Uh, in the end, they will do the same thing. That's so how it's really hard. Mm. I just try to. The first thing I did was look at the most popular ones because usually that's kind of an indication that's what's good. But there are also a bunch of really bad ones. Uh, I don't want to be really pointing at anything, but there are a few bad ones in there that are also really popular. Um, most, uh, so I also looked at code quality and how purely they implemented Flux and stuff like that. And I came uh, the, also really interesting, uh, but the most interesting one for me was Flummox. So I decided to download that and then read this. So I was, first I was kind of disappointed. And then I uh, got really enthusiastic about this new library that apparently was even better than the one that I picked. It was even so good, apparently, to this, uh, to this developer that he was going to quit his own implementation. So I was really interested in what was so good about it. And the thing is that this Redux that, uh, that was new was actually not Flux. It, it changed a few things. And it changed a few things so that it was actually, especially for developers, it added a really, few really nice advantages. And even the, the, the Facebook developers themselves realized that this was, this, those were really nice. So you got some really nice responses from there as well. But let's talk a bit about Redux, because uh, we are using it right now for our uh, applications. And I'm going to tell you why it's so cool. Uh, instead of having multiple stores, as in the previous example, I hope you remember it roughly. Uh, instead of having multiple stores, uh, Redux puts everything in one big store. Uh, so your entire application state is saved in one big store. And don't think of that as something complicated because it's just a big JavaScript object that has every state of your all the state of your application. And the second thing it does is it separates the actual state of your store and uh, the logic. Uh, and it puts those logic in what the developer calls reducers. Um, and the reducers are, the, are basically the logic that changes the, uh, the state of your, of your big store. Now, there are two big advantages here for developers. The first one is because the logic and the actual state of your store, of your, uh, of your application are separated, you can start to hot reload. And hot reload is a really cool new concept but and it means that if this, the moment you are um, you want to change something in your application, only you change your code and you would save and would refresh your application and you would lose everything and then you would have to start again and find that bug and see if it's fixed. With uh, hot reloading, you can just literally just uh, change your code, save, and it will uh, hot plug it into your application. So you don't have to refresh your application, which is really nice, especially if you you probably notice if you're building an application. You have to go through. You have to log in, go through three different firms, go somewhere deep in your application because there is a bug, and you try to fix it, and you say, change some code, and then you have to refresh your application, and then you have to do it all over again just to get to that single bug and see if you're, it's actually fixed. That's really, really annoying if you're building a web application. Um, but with hot reloading, you don't have to actually refresh it. And because the store is now just one big, uh, big object, really. Um, and the reducers don't actually change that object, but every time uh, the, the state is changed of your application, it will just return a completely new state, and in some cases, again, not a new state. Uh, you can actually effectively put an old one back, and you can start to time travel through your application. And uh, if you combine those two features, you suddenly get a whole new perspective in developing web applications. Because you can now, let's say you have this bug very deep in your application, you can just go there. Uh, you can see what the bug does. You can time travel back a bit just to before the bug took place. You can change your code. You can just go from there on again without ever refreshing your app, which is just, it saves you so much time. It's so, such a really, such a really cool feature. I just had to put this in. I found this already. This is roughly how I felt the first time that I realized it. Um, and I'm not the only one, actually, that found it this cool. Um, I hope you can see this. Uh, this is a graph of popularity. And this is roughly like June, where I started using it, when I first saw the message on the Flowbox website. And yeah, it has quickly become the most popular implementation out there, because you can basically ignore the blue line. It's true. Um, I don't know, how am I in time? I only have half an hour, so. Uh, 
I cannot tell you about everything that we've been doing, but there's a lot. Uh, we've been working a lot with ES6, for example, because that's a great uh, combination with Redux. A uh, developer of Redux uses a lot of ES6 and beyond patterns to, uh, 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 to really elevate the, the options of what you can do. Um, we use Babel uh, to, uh, 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 to transpile uh, the JSX and, uh, and the ES6. And we also use Webpack. And if you're building a web application, uh, should, uh, you really have to look into Webpack. I, built, I wrote a blog post about it a while ago. Uh, definitely look, look into that as well. If I talk about all this stuff, I can talk probably for about two or three hours more. I have, ten, I have nine minutes left? Okay, because then I have a bit talk too fast. <laughs> um, I didn't want to go too much into technical uh, detail because it's, yeah, I had to make a choice, but we have Robert uh, talking more about how to actually create a component library with uh, React, and we have uh, Lewis over here, and he's going to talk about uh, how you can also modularize your CSS as well with, uh, uh, with React, so we have some really nice in-depth uh, uh, talks as well. Well, now we have some time for questions then. Anybody has a question? Yes. Um, if the choice of our framework would have uh, effect on the users, and then you may need uh, speed. speed, yeah, performance. I think in the end, it does. Performance is not the, the most important part of choosing a framework. I think if you set it up right, whether you choose Angular or some kind of React uh, version or uh, Ember or whatever, though I prefer that Ember is fast, but I, I'm pretty sure you can get Ember fast as well. Um, I think it doesn't going to matter that much. As long as you set it up properly uh, and don't do any weird things, I think any framework can be fast. So I don't think, no, this was not really a consideration. Um, what does help though is the, is the, is the, the isomorphic or universal way that's the, the, that you run the code on the, on the, on the server as, as, as on, the, on the client as well, the, the slide I showed earlier. Um, that really helps in bootstrapping your application, so you can get a lot of performance uh, uh, advantage there. So that really helps for uh, for React. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can do that with other applications. I think Angular is really hard. Perhaps Angular 2 they make it a bit easier. But and I know I'm, they're working with Ember to do that as well. But I think right now that React is the only one that can do that very really properly. Yeah. They yeah, answer your question. Good. Any other questions? Question there in the back. the structure of the Redux store. Um, let's go back to this. The re oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, by default, you don't actually have to design much about it uh, because normally you would have different kinds of stores and you would have uh, the uh, responsibilities of, of different state in a different store. Uh, here it is just uh, separated under uh, basically just a main key uh, and it's the reducer that determines what part of the state is going to be changed. So, you don't have to actually organize anything in the, in this big store. It all uh, organizes itself mainly. Uh, there are some things you can keep in mind if your store grows a lot. Uh, the creator of Redux also wrote a great uh, library for normalizing data, for example, in the, in the big store, which can be a great help, especially if you have a lot of different dependencies between uh, between data. But in general, it kind of uh, does it. It organizes itself. You don't have to do too much with it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. But for example, what is your, uh, the view state of your application? Like, for example, which item is selected on this particular component? Do you use local state for that, or you also perceive that in the, in the Redux store? Um, good question. Uh, it depends a bit right now. If it's information you really want to save, then uh, we put it in the store, uh, and 
we don't actually usually don't persist it in any kind of data store uh, in the, in the back end. Um, but if it's just a, a simple view state, like whether a toggle is on or off or something like that, we don't really save it. Uh, save it. We just keep it in the state of the, of the, the view itself, usually. But it depends a bit. It's, uh, it's something we're still figuring out as well, because we're not, we've been using this for a couple months now. It's actually Redux has only been out for a couple months. So it's, uh, developers are actually still finding out new things every day about it. And there's a lot of active discussion about it, how you should use it and how you shouldn't use it. And it's still a kind of ongoing process. Yeah. There's no, there's no uh, book yet about how to perfectly use Redux. It's all, it's all very new. Any more questions? Yeah. Anything uh, like um, why is it better than Browserify or my Gulf or whatever else? Uh, the first thing, I, uh, whether why Webpack is, is why I prefer Webpack over uh, Gulf. And uh, uh, the first thing I did was use Gulf and Browserify because we use Gulf in our website and it's great for managing assets and stuff like that. So the first thing I did was just use Gulf because I was used to using Gulf. Uh, so the first thing I also did was take Browserify and uh, Browserify is a module bundler, by the way. So Make sure that you can pack all your JavaScript into one big file. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing I did. Um, but the issue with Gulf is you script everything. And the more complex it becomes, especially when you're building different kinds of bundles, the more you're actually scripting. And I ended up almost writing more script for Gulf than actually for the application. So it kind of started to annoy me. And the thing about Webpack is it. Um, it, it does one big assumption, and that assumption is that you're building a JavaScript application. So it takes, by that, that simple uh, assumption, it takes a lot of work out of your hands. You, instead of having to script everything together, uh, you can just configure the basics, and then you're already set. So it's just, it saves me a lot of time. It saves me a lot of time, that's, uh, uh, that's it. And there are uh, another few advantages, especially when it comes to stuff like hot reloading, where Webpack has a few really nice advantages as well. So it's uh, definitely worth looking into if you're uh, building a JavaScript application. Thanks. Good question. Thank you. Any more? Or uh, I don't know. Time. Yes. Two minutes. Three. Yeah. Three. Ah. And we have at least one more question, right? No. Well, uh, let's go to this one. No. Thank you. Yeah.